Nothing on the Bonnell Foundation's Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. Cystic fibrosis can be a devastating diagnosis, but living with the disease can bring positivity and a new appreciation for each day. From the Bonnell Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, it's the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast, sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical. Here's your host, Laura Bonnell. I have a lot of wonderful things to say about Vigil Trivedi. First, my friend Beth Van Stone, also on this podcast, asked me if I had read her book. I had not at the time, although I had heard about it, and I was listening to the Lost Women of Science podcast, and it was so interesting to learn about Dr. Dorothy Anderson in 1938, who first discovered CF. And then I heard Vigil speak on that podcast, and all my worlds just came together. I had to speak to this amazing woman. Trivedi is an award-winning journalist specializing in long-form narrative features about biology, medicine, and health, and she currently works as the senior science editor for National Geographic. Just after the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic in March of 2020, Vigil finished writing her first book, Breath from Salt, A Deadly Genetic Disease, A New Era in Science, and the Patients and Families Who Changed Medicine Forever. That came out in September of 2020, and of course, that's the book that we're talking about in this podcast. Bill Gates listed Breath from Salt as one of his top five book picks for winter 2020, and this book was also long listed for the 2021 P-E-N-E-O Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. Yay for that. So her undergraduate fascination with biochemistry and molecular biology at Oberlin College also compelled her to pursue a master's degree in molecular cell developmental biology at UCLA. And her love of writing drew her to journalism rather than to a lab bench and to a second master's degree in science journalism from New York University. Clearly, she's an underachiever. I'm joking, of course. Vigil has lived in the UK and Australia and is now based in Washington, D.C. Beth Van Stone, who you have met in previous podcasts, is a CF mom and advocate in Canada. She's brought about a lot of change as it relates to CF. So let's get started. So glad to have you. Vigil Trivedi, so wonderful um, to have read your book and have been able to talk with you a couple times. So grateful that um, Beth connected us. Um, I guess I wanted to start by saying that, and I want Beth's take on this too, but when I was reading your book, it was happening right then. Your book was one of the most exciting books to read. I felt like it was everything was happening in real time, even though I knew a lot of history. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Every, you know, when the gene was found, I was, you know, like my husband was in the other room and I would just like yell out, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, they discovered the gene and oh my gosh, you know, Dr. Paul Quinton, I know him and things like that. So I think you did a fabulous job. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess I, I wanted to talk to you first about why did you decide, I mean, you say in your book, but tell us why you decided to go more in depth instead of just doing maybe a story about Kaleidico. Oh, Kaleidico was like a rabbit hole for me. Um, I started, I mean, first of all, the second you meet Bob Bell, your, your reality changes. Um, you know, the first time I met him, I walked into his office and he was talking before I even sat down and put my recorder out and all of that. And he started talking about the future before we'd even discussed the history of Kaleidico. And he was telling me, you know, this is just the beginning. There are these other drugs that are going to be coming. It's going to be amazing. You know, it's not just going to be 4% of patients. It's going to be 50 and then it's going to be 90. And I mean, as my entree into this story, hearing this prediction for the future about what it would mean for um, cystic fibrosis patients, I was just instantly spellbound. I mean, I could not believe what I was hearing. And, you know, I would have to plow my way through the story of Kaleidico first with him. Um, but then, you know, just hearing about all the 
amazing discoveries that were about to occur and what was happening behind the scenes. It was just riveting as a, you know, an ex-science person. Well, I guess I'm still a science person, but as an ex-lab person, I was instantly hooked and I just wanted to know more. And then um, what was really the linchpin is when I met Joe and Kathy O'Donnell and um, learned about their journey um, with cystic fibrosis. And, you know, at that moment, I, I had to I had to write a book. And I've never been so focused in my life before. I think I was, after meeting them, I was up for you know several days straight because I, I just couldn't get my mind off this story. And I, I knew it was the beginning of something incredibly special. No, it's incredible. And the passion that you speak about comes through so clearly in the book. That's, um, it seems like it wouldn't be, you know, you're talking about CF, you're talking about the history, like, how can that be engaging and exciting and, you know, and it was because you had so many amazing aspects surrounding it and the involvement of the human part and the science part. And, you know, it was just incredible. And I, I love the life you brought to that story. It was a uh, page turner. Amazing. Thank you. I think, I mean, a big part of it was, you know, I'd been a science writer for about you know 12 years when I first discovered this story. And I knew that the secret to telling a good story was to tell it through the people. Um, and you know, time after time, I kept meeting amazing, amazing inspirational people. And that was really the key because you know, you can read the history by going through archives. You can learn the science by reading a textbook but putting it all together with all the characters who actually made these discoveries or launched the foundation or had children who suffered from this disease, those were the personalities that I wanted to tell the story through. So I didn't want it to be my, my vision. I wanted to tell the story through time, through the eyes of those people. And I knew that that was the only way to tell a story that was this complicated and and this long. Um, it had to be, you know, through other people's eyes. And I also think, I mean, you really got to know them because, as you said, it took you eight years to write. <laughs> so you really got to know them. And for anyone who's thinking about writing a book, I would say that this seems like a labor of love, to say the least for you, and that you really were... I mean, you're part of the CF community now. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Embraced by all of us that have read the book and more that will. <laughs> and Let's yes. Hope. And so what kept you going over those eight years? Was it just as you got more stories and met more family members and the history and the drugs kept changing? Well, it was it was sort of this snowball effect because, you know, the, the starting point was meeting Bob Bell. The, the next point was meeting Joe and Kathy. And, you know, when I started on this story was 2012 when Kaleidico just came out. And, you know, knowing from Bob Bell that there was more exciting stuff on the horizon, I started following the trials. And as I was following the trials, I was meeting the scientists at Vertex. I was meeting scientists at scientific retreats um, that had been organized by Bill Sketch at the foundation. And, and so I was meeting a lot of different people. And then I was meeting patients and families. And I wanted to see what would happen for those other families who didn't have the G551D uh, mutation. Um, you know, what was going to, what, how was this going to play out for them? You know, what was in store for them? And so I was, I was seeing the science, I was seeing the families, the current day families, and I was learning the history of the foundation, including, you know, meeting with um, Doris Tulson when I flew down to Florida um, and almost didn't get back here because there was a hurricane and they canceled my flight. Uh, but that aside, and Doris, one of the pioneer oh moms, my God, whose daughter has CF. Yeah, she. And then Joe and Kathy, an, you know, had Joey, who you know died um, young from CF. Right, for right. anyone who hasn't read your book yet, just to, to 
bring them up to speed on this. And so this is how you brought it all together. These were the pioneers. These were the Mm -hmm. parents who made this foundation happen. Right. And it was, you know, because, you know, if you come to this as an outsider, as I did, um, you know, as you can see, I'm, I'm Indian. I don't have any genetic traits linking me to, to CF, although, you know, stay tuned for that one. Um, right, because we just need to say this too. CF is a diverse disease. It, it is, is not a Caucasian disease. Yeah. It is in it Egypt. Is. It is everywhere. So, And that is a thread that I'll be following up on. So um, hang on for that. But um, as an outsider coming to this, you know, it was learning how the families dealt with this disease, learning how Joe and Kathy um, had a son with this disease whom they lost in, you know, 1986. I mean, that's a long time ago, but hearing how they stayed committed to the foundation and it became, you know, part of their mission, part of Joey's legacy to stay connected with the community and help them in a way, you know, to get treatments and cures. And the only way you get treatments and cures is by raising funding and paying for science, paying for very high quality science. And that's what Joe, you know, masters. I mean, he is the man when it comes to fundraising. And seeing how, you know, I kept on thinking, you know, if this had happened to my family, wouldn't I just push this disease away, try and push everything related to the disease away from me? But they did the opposite and many parents did the opposite. And I was so moved by that um, altruism and that ability to just, you know, take on that hardship and continue on for the families for whom it did still matter. It was it was very moving. I think it, it really changed so many parts of my brain and how I think about the world. Um, and it has it's had a really profound impact on me. That was one of the things that really stood out to me and and looking at history that you you wrote in the book and the history and the beginnings and the trials and the tribulations, the same trials and tribulations that we see now as parents, you know, Mm -hmm. with fighting for funding for, for, you know, and fighting for the last 10% and fighting for a cure. Um, I just love the family part and the families are so committed and so working right Mm -hmm. along with researchers and fundraising and and being part of a solution. And that's one of the things that really stood out to me was how committed all these families were to getting to where we are, right? And uh, we owe a lot to them, truly, all of us do, to look back at the history. I think that was one of the really interesting things was how the foundation, you know, really, you know, beginning with the registry in, in the early 1960s, you know, made, they made it clear that if you want good science, if you want treatments and cures, you have to participate in the research process. You have to enroll yourself in trials and experiments so that scientists can learn about this disease. And with such a small population, you know, the burden was distributed on everyone. And I think one thing that the foundation made very clear from the beginning was you know, that they needed the patients to be active and to advocate for themselves and for the families to advocate for their children um, in order to move the science along. Because unless you have people participating in these trials and being um, willing to take on the burden and the sacrifice, you're not going to be able to develop drugs, Um, especially because with this disease, as you all know, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, there's no animal model, or at least back in the early 2000s, there was no good animal model for testing drugs. So it was really a lot of self-advocacy and a lot of, you know, um, sacrifice and work that the families had to take on. And that amazed me, too. Um, It actually, you know, when when the COVID vaccines (laughs) came up, I signed up immediately to be a a first jab. Um, Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank I mean, you. They didn't pick me, which I was very disappointed about. <laughs> but, you know, I was like, this is my part. This is I have to help support the research. And this is something I can do. So that is something that I really learned um, from your community. And I think one thing that 
brought your book together too, and I'm sure Beth will agree, is that there were a lot of misdiagnosis stories in your book. Almost yes. every family had the same misdiagnosis that we had. Um, every single parent. So that was also what propelled them to all get together because no one's listening to us. The doctors don't think it's possible or they think we're crazy. They're sending us home. They're, you know, just completely um, ignoring the mom, you know, and oh, you know, just go back home, your child's fine, or they have something else. Uh, so I think that was the impetus for the, all those families, right, to say we need to do this one foundation, this CF foundation. Right. And it was interesting to in your book to see that whole journey of how it came to be, and that how important each the funding from every um, every organization had to go to the national chapter. Right, right. And that was a big change. And that was a big shakeup in the history of the foundation when you had, you know, lots of individual chapters, you know, doing their own thing, running their own events, supporting their own community, and then saying, no, everybody, we're going to take all the resources that, you know, come from each chapter, we're going to put them in one pot, and a team of scientists and parents and advocates are going to decide together which research we should support. So rather than supporting, you know, um, personal care for local children, you know, it was a really dramatic move to say, all right, we're not going to support this as much. We want to, you know, really get to the heart of this disease. We want to get to the root of this illness and we want to we want to get to a cure. Um, so I think that was a big shift for families and it didn't go over easily, um, but it did, it did go through. And I just want to step back quickly to the registry part and CF has one of the best registries of all the diseases in the world. Mm -hmm. And with, um, I do some work with the Canadian organization for rare, like work with rare diseases. And so often they come back to the registry because so many of the other you know, rare disease, they don't have the information and research and studies that we have. And that's so huge to moving forward. And it was so forward thinking to for them to realize we have to put all this stuff together, because it's still helping us move forward, and building on what we have. So um, I just wanted to go back to that, because we're very fortunate in our community to have that registry. It's helped tremendously get to where we are. I think that was, you know, that was something very important in the book um, because, you know, when I started to, when I learned about this registry, you know, I got so excited because it seemed that when I was looking at the history of the foundation, all these steps had been taken that eventually moved towards, you know, a treatment, a medicine, an effective medicine. And it struck me that, you know, oh my God, the, the CF community has actually come up with a recipe um, for, for solving diseases and finding cures. And this whole process could be a roadmap for other communities with other rare diseases to, to help solve these issues. So, you know, it wasn't just that they, they created something for their own community this can be used by others. And I think that's what's very powerful. In addition to the registry that we were talking about, and I think that the, you know, the CF parents in the CF group is one of the strongest. And I think we're a model for other rare diseases, mm -hmm. because we're very organized and very proactive and, and all of that. But I also thought it was interesting when you talked about some of the history that I had no idea about that they the doctors, I his name escapes me right now, but that was um, promoting a low fat diet instead of right. the high fat diet that they are saying now because his thought was oh then their you know the stools won't be so messy so right. that backfired but yeah right and the and the fact that you know scientists from several countries were all coming to this conclusion um as Dorothy Anderson was homing in on the um on characterizing this disease. You had people in Australia, you had people in Europe, you had people in Boston and New York who were all starting to get this sense that, 
a disease that was originally described as celiac disease because the, the initial symptoms were very similar, um, that this actually wasn't celiac disease because you couldn't cure it with a dietary change. And this was something more severe, more deadly. And it was interesting that in this period in the 30s, there were different people coming to the same conclusion. Um, but it was the, the brilliant Dorothy Anderson um, who actually nailed it and got that first publication where she coined the disease as cystic fibrosis of the pancreas. And of course, it affects every other organ in the body. But, you know, that's where we started in 1938. And yeah, I found her story incredibly compelling. And I think there were so many amazing women scientists um, that I met and featured in the book because they just blew my mind. I mean, Sabine Hadida from um, from Vertex. I mean, if, if I'd had her as a professor, I would be a chemist probably working for her right now. I mean, she's just amazing women, amazing. They just didn't let go. No. They just kept going. What and 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 like her, what were some of the other scientists that you were really impressed with that kind of blew your mind? <laughs> I had a great couple of days with Paul Quentin, who is just an amazing person and he's really fun. <laughs> Outside the lab, we we went out, we had dinner and then we we talked in his lab and it was great and hearing, I mean, knowing somebody who diagnosed themselves with CF at a period in time where physicians had barely heard of the disease. You know, he looked this up when he was in college. So he was about 19 when he diagnosed himself um, with cystic fibrosis. Um, and then learning everything he could about the disease and eventually being the one that figured out what was going wrong in the cell that, you know, the, the cell couldn't balance, balance salt and water. And that primary defect was responsible for, for the thick mucus in the lungs, the salt on the skin, all the gastrointestinal dysfunction and everything else that accompanies this disease. Figuring that out, you know, took him from his late teens to his early forties and you know, he's still here to talk about it. And he's, he's the most dynamic person. And he's still constantly thinking about the cell and the proteins and, and other routes to treatments. And he is one of the most dynamic people I've ever met. And I had, you know, it's, it, it was wonderful meeting him in person. He is great. I have danced with him at a CF conference before. <laughs> he is a lot of fun. And he is, he is the guy who was like, cutting him, you know, taking his own tissue to figure this out. Yeah, I mean, he needed a source of tissue that had the mutation in it. And he has gouge marks on his legs and arms from taking samples of his own skin so that he could get the sweat glands um, and look at how they were moving salt and, and mortar around. And so he actually mined his own body for the resources for the experiments, which is just, it's so Paul, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there are so many different scientists. That's what I loved too, like uh, Fred and all of these, just so many that you highlighted. It was great to not just hear about maybe the three that we hear about all the time, but there were just so many that had such a huge role and different degrees of excitement. That just really kept me reading too. I just love every one of them. I know, and there, you know, one thing that it really uh, brought to light to me was, you know, you hear on the news, you know, pharmaceutical companies do this, pharmaceutical companies do that. And, you know, they they use all these, you know, robots in the labs and you, you have no idea of how a drug is developed. And I think, you know, when I learned how Vertex developed this drug, it was almost like sort of an artisanal cheese maker, but it was an artisanal drug maker. You know, it was a tiny group of scientists, you know, all told, you know, around 10 to 15 in the early days. And they were building molecules one by one, 
testing each of those molecules on a set of cells, measuring hundreds of variables. And it wasn't some mass production line where they're cranking out possible drugs. It's one by one, one person sitting at a bench, moving this molecule through various stages until they have something to test. And it was so personal. You know, each one of these molecules was like a little baby for them, you know, and, you know, they had a personal stake in how that molecule performed when it was tested in cells that, you know, were originally taken from patients um, with cystic fibrosis. And so it really, I was so moved by that because you could see this wasn't just, you know, I think scientists at these companies are often portrayed in ways that you know, maybe that's the way it is at other companies, but at Vertex, this was this was personal, and you could really, really feel that. And meeting the 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 chemists and the biologists, and hearing their stories, and you know what motivated them. I mean, I was such a I was such a groupie. It was kind of embarrassing, um, but it they they really motivated me and I, I was glad that I had a background in organic chemistry so that I could understand some of it. Um, but it, it really, um, the science was enthralling. Yeah, and I think we can both relate to that, right, Beth? I am so thankful um, for Vertex for investing in our kids and in our, you know, we all know business is business and, and rare and, and all the investment. And I have always felt, and I, I don't want to be waving any particular flag, but Vertex has saved my daughter's life. Like she was one of the 4% that got Kaleidico when she was very, very sick. I truly believe that she's here now because of all the effort and care and passion that they put into it. And, and I still feel it from them. They care about our community. They're not, they're, they don't want to leave anyone behind. They're still going out and working and trying to find. And um, I think we're very fortunate because as a rare disease, that's rare to have that much mm -hmm. invested into a rare disease where there isn't a huge market. So I, for one, am just so thankful that they've done everything and the personal touch is there. Like I still feel that and, and that they genuinely are invested in our community and thank <laughs> I'm thankful for that. Right. And I think it is because the families demanded a connection, right? The families demanded a connection with Vertex from the beginning and everybody was working together and the scientists saw the need as you reflected it in your stories too. So it was, uh, you know, very obvious uh, going back and forth between scientists and families. And I think you know, Joe and Kathy is that, you know, when they're trying to save their son and, and trying to make a difference, you tell that story beautifully throughout um, your book as how that impacted so many different lives and so many different families. And you really got to know them quite well. I did. I did. Um, and yeah, they are very close to my heart. <laughs> They feel they feel very much like family to me because, you know, they um, when we met, uh, I'd done a bunch of magazine articles. I had, you know, heavy science training, but I'd never written a book before. And uh, they really took a big leap of faith with me um, and trusted me to tell their story because um, uh, I'd never written a book. I just had a crazy amount of enthusiasm. Awesome. And, and, and just feeling that this was the story that I had to tell. Because for the first time, you know, I had met people that had truly moved me. The science was in my blood. You know, I was biochem major in, in college and then, you know, molecular genetics for a master's. So I felt like this was, this was my calling. And, um, you know, Joe originally asked me, you know, how, how many meetings do you think it would take to do this how many interviews and you know this is back in 2012 and I said to him I said oh you know a few hours I think I'll get the material I need of course you know eight years later and more than a hundred <laughs> hours of interviews later um 
<laughs> I finished the book. <laughs> and there were points where, you know, I, I received emails from Doris Tolson and <laughs> said to me, you know, I would like to read this book before I go. And <laughs> that's, that <laughs> is both Doris's wit, but it's also pressure. <laughs> Um, right. She's 94 yes. now. So I she mean, did get her wish. She did get yes. her wish. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, trying to follow all these drugs, all these families. And, you know, Joe and Kathy were a, a critical part of this story because they stayed. I mean, they're still involved, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't let down. In fact, they've got even crazier fundraising goals than before. Right. It's uh milestones three yeah driven by a dream yes. yeah and it was you know yeah. we joked about it you know when i the in i finished probably um getting permissions for the photographs in the book um around the same date that the who declared a, a global pandemic and all the libraries were shutting down i was rushing to get legal permissions for things and I joked with Joe, I said, okay, so when's the next campaign starting? And he said to me, with not without skipping a beat, he said, it's already happening. I was just like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> going to be covering this for my entire life. So, you know. It could be a never ending story, truly. No, it yeah. will Because end, the story. And the ending will be good. It will be good. Yes, the cure. And the yes. cure will be good and it'll be for everyone. And, you know, I mentioned. Um, Bob Bell, but I have to tell you that one of the people who was so patient with me and dealt with every question I had was um, was Preston Campbell. And he was answering questions and talking to me. I'm telling you, when we were days away from sending this book to the, the printer and he, you know, he was you know, with the foundation almost as long as Bob Bell. And, you know, obviously he's a phys physician and, and knows everything about this disease. But I'm telling you, you talk about someone who's patient um, with someone who isn't personally linked to this disease. Wow, I couldn't have done it without him. Amazing. <laughs> that is, it is. And a tribute. I mean, it's a beautiful history for them. It's a beautiful book, a very nice tribute to the CF Foundation and those families. And I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you about Paul and Sue Flessner. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I'm pronouncing their last name sure. right. But tell us that little story. That was that was another wow. That was another great nugget that you put in there about another connection and how it played out. Yeah, so at a time, it was around, um, I think, 1998. And this was the period where gene therapy for CF had failed. Um, you know, well, it hadn't completely failed, but it was it was looking pretty bad. Looks like it was looking like, you know, when they found the gene in 1989, they instantly, many people instantly assumed that gene therapy was going to be the way to treat cystic fibrosis. And the technology, the viruses, the strategies available in the 90s, they just weren't good enough. The theory was there. It worked on a minuscule scale, but it didn't it didn't um, lend any therapeutic benefit. Um, so that's when, you know, Bob Bell and Preston Campbell decided that they had to radically shift um, their strategy and what they needed to do was they needed to hire a pharmaceutical company or invest in a pharmaceutical company that was willing to look at this disease and develop a treatment specifically to treat the protein that was malfunctioning. And, you know, that's not an easy thing to do and it's an expensive thing to do. And the foundation needed the money to go ahead and invest in a pharmaceutical company to develop drugs specifically for this disease. And no health profit, nonprofit had ever done that before. No health nonprofit had gone out and said, I want you to develop a drug that will help treat this genetic defect and fix the protein in the cell that isn't working. That had never been done before. And so Bob Bell and Preston Campbell sort of throughout open the floodgates and they started reaching out to pharmaceutical companies and um you know 
They weren't getting much of a response, except from a tiny little biotech company called Aurora Biosciences. And there were a couple of scientists there who thought, oh, you know, this is a crazy ambitious project. Who could ever fix a broken protein while it's actually in the human body? That's nuts, but wow, what great science will try it. And, you know, so little bits of fundraising that the foundation was doing sort of was fueling this slow, slow, slow um, generation of, or rather pursuing this idea. Um, and, but money was an issue. You know, developing drugs is very, very expensive. Testing things is expensive. And so um, one of the parents, uh, a CF parent named um, Paul Flesner um, and his wife, Sue Flesner, they had two children uh, with cystic fibrosis and they were out in Seattle. Uh, Paul Flesner was a top executive for Microsoft and, you know, one of the elite top five guys at the company and he knew um, Bill Gates intimately and um, he knew that Bill Gates was you know that was also the beginning of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation so he knew that you know um, Bill Gates was very interested in philanthropy interested in scientific progress number crunching and all of the rest of it and so he talked to Bob Bell about what was needed in terms of money to sort of develop a prototype at this pharmaceutical company and say, you know, how much money do you need to figure out if your pharmaceutical strategy is actually going to work? And Bob Bell threw out a number and then Paul Flesner took it to Bill Gates. And then, you know, a few steps later, um, very soon afterwards, there was a meeting with Bill Gates Sr. and Bob Bell and a couple of other people from, from the foundation, including Bonnie Ramsey. And they talked about this initiative, what it would take, you know, what deliverables would they be? You know, what, what would emerge from this, um, this collaboration with this Aurora Biosciences? And they talked about it and um, not so long afterwards, um, Bob Bell got a check in the mail for $20 million. And it came in by regular mail, just in a brown envelope. And the person that opened it nearly had a heart attack when she saw this. And that money was really the seed money for Aurora Biosciences, which then was taken over by Vertex. Um, so if it hadn't been for that initial seed, there might never have been enough money to get that that drug project off the ground and do the pilot testing um, that was necessary before you jump into a full full fledged um, pharmaceutical design. Um, so it was amazing, and I I went out to Seattle and I and I went and met with um, Paul and Sue Flesner who were just amazing, wonderful people. And, you know, they really told me their story. And that was, you know, the, again, it was a trust thing. And I really appreciated the trust that people had in me. Um, you know, I would come out of nowhere and ask for intimate details of their lives. And people shared with me, they were very open. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have done that without that trust and, you know, that sharing. So that was an amazing, another amazing opportunity that I had. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and I don't know if now Dr. Bonnie Ramsey, she was the one who then said, Oh, we need a high fat diet. Is that correct? Am I thinking correctly I think about she's her? One of I the thought... people that came to that conclusion. And that was quite much earlier. But yeah, she initially, um, when she came out of medical school, she did not want to be connected to CF. She had seen, you know, the really gruesome um, trajectory of this disease and she saw what it did to children. Um, but through just, you know, fate decisions, life decisions, she became one of the leaders of the field um, from Seattle Children's. Um, so, yeah, an amazing woman ran a, some of the early trials with Palmazyme and then with um, 
Oh my God, the inhaled antibiotic, which just name of which just went out of my head. Um, so yeah, it was incredible, incredible community. It is. And Beth, what were some of your other favorite parts of the book? You know, I, I always seem to come back to the same parts that how everybody worked together, how everybody um, worked uh, hand in hand with the researchers and hand in hand with the fundraisers and how all the families were all in to, to, to work through such a problem. And in the very early stages, when it must be one of the most complicated diseases out there, you know, it, it hits everything. And um, I think that's, probably what really stood out to me and a proud part of it is that uh, the hospital that my daughter went to sick kids was a big part of um, having that gene identified and it's such a we got to go up to the lab and meet a lot of the people in that and it was really exciting because that was the beginning of where we are now with the modulators so wonderful people wonderful work and the storytelling it all goes together so amazing like it's not just science it's life and science and things that we all live like we're all of the parents are involved and know what's going on in in all the different aspects of cf right. so yeah no it's amazing yeah and i had the opportunity to meet um lap chi Choi, who was you know the the first gene hunter when it came to cf and, he, you know, he told me such wonderful personal details down to the dinner that they had, you know, when he was about to share with one of his colleagues that, you know, they thought they had found the mutation. Um, and it was it was so exciting to go back. I mean, some of the people who worked on the gene are still at Sick Kids, and he sort of rounded up a, a, a group of people and, um, yeah, it was nice to, you know, travel back in time and, and sort of hear the excitement, hear the path of discovery from the actual pioneer. Um, so that that was pretty special. It was interesting when we went up to the lab to meet, we met a woman who we had done a lot of advocating in Canada for Kaleidico for the funding. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, Maddie, that's my daughter. Vanstone, are you related to these Vanstones? Now, she was one of the researchers that worked on this. And anyway, she had spent a lot of time with our rel my husband's relatives down east. So it was such a weird connection because she had worked on this gene. She saw our advocacy in the last name, but she's like, could it be? And here it was. It was a really odd connection. It's like, yes, that's, that's us, right? So amazing, small world. There are lots of connections within the CF community. <laughs> that was, you know, it's like a it's like a spider web and you know, the connection everybody knows everybody and and it's just it's such a tight knit community. It was it was I mean, it still kind of blows my mind. <laughs> right. Well, and that's what Beth and I talk about all the time is the connection and that she's in Canada, I'm in the US, but the connection was instant and the same. And like Beth and I were talking about your book, like, oh my gosh, we heard from this family and that's us. Like they sound just like us. And then, oh my gosh, that family and the misdiagnosis or whatever it was. And that, you know, Joe and Kathy uh, saved our kids, really. I yes. mean, they made it so they could be on these, you know, specialty drugs so that they have a chance um, that their son didn't have. And how selfless and beautiful is that? And how important it is to remember where we all started. And I think that's the, the key, um, Laura and Vigil, is we're all continuing on. Like my daughter had Kaleidico, the modulator, but we never will forget the people that don't. You know, and I think it's such a right. common thread through our community that we really believe no one left behind. And, you know, so, you know, Maddie was doing well on this, but there was 95% of the people that still didn't have anything. So advocating and participating in research and fundraising is just what you do for the rest of your community, right? We all look out for each other. And mm -hmm. that's what I saw in the book as well, right? Like working together. And I, 
And I think it's, and I was going to ask you about your next book, because I also yes. <laughs> think it's something that we've, we, that we've all already talked about is that in Egypt, it's, they're not on a level playing field. They don't even have medications approved there because doctors, you know, until 2007, weren't even testing for cystic fibrosis. And now that they've been testing, they've diagnosed a thousand people, but in the next several years, they're going to diagnose so many more. So. Are you doing another book? <laughs> Is that what it's going to no be pressure. about? <laughs> um, I see some articles in the near future. Um, and um, yeah, I am. I will update that book um, when, when there are developments. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah, I think this is just something that I'm going to, you know, that's part of me now. And I will just continue to do forever or, you know, until it's done and, and everyone has a treatment and, you know, hopefully I'll be able to chronicle the cure, you know, and we're, we're oh, getting I there. I absolutely hope so. We're getting there. Yes. Like, you know, yes. when our children were, were diagnosed, there wasn't anything even close. Like even the thought of, you know, we were always looking for the cure. Of course, that's what you do, but the thought of a pill that can do what these pills do is just mind boggling. And if, if we can do it that is. and we they've got that figured out, like we're just so close. And I, I look forward to reading that book where you <laughs> write about the cure. <laughs> and have <Me> too. Too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think years. that was one of the, Right. The interesting things about you really got in those the brains of those scientists, you knew what they were thinking and that yes. they were sleeping and lying awake and thinking about it constantly. And just, I guess I, I kind of thought that but I didn't realize to what extent, like the first time I met Fred Van Gore, I, you know, I was there when that was another part when you were talking about testifying in Orcambi, and then everybody was clapping when Van walked out, like, or when Fred walked out, like, I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I was there. Like, I, like, I saw him, I saw the appreciation, we were so grateful to him. And he was so overwhelmed by the appreciation from parents. So it's so good that they know that the families are cheering them on, I think. I think they do. Although, you know, the, the hard part of, of, you know, telling the story of a pharmaceutical company is, you know, you're never alone with the scientist. Um, there are lawyers with you, there are public relations people with you. Um, and, and that was hard for me because, you know, I'm used to very personal one-on-one -on -one interviews. It's something that, um, you know, it's sort of a trademark of my reporting. And, you know, that's how you get real stories out of people. So it was kind of strange um, in the beginning when I started working with the scientists at Vertex um, to have these other people in the room. You know, it was, it was, it was not private. It was, you know, there are lawyers guarding the intellectual property. And I would joke with them and say, you know, you really, overrating me because I can't possibly do anything with what you're what I'm learning here but you know they these lawyers didn't really have a sense of humor so <laughs> but um but it was um yeah I mean it was that was that was a big challenge is to be able to spend time with the the scientists because obviously they have better things to do more important things to do like building drugs, saving lives, rather than talking to a reporter. But um, it, it took, you know, it, it was weird to interview people about really personal times in their lives and, and intimate moments when you have, you know, a couple of other people in the room. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it couldn't, it wouldn't have been right to not tell you know that thread of the story and i think that was another challenge was you know mixing in the foundation the families and then the science so it was sort of a braided narrative and you know it, without one of those you the story doesn't work yes and i wondered is there a story from your book that you wanted to talk about here that maybe we didn't touch on that you thought oh my gosh this was such a great 
great aspect of the book? I think, you know, hearing some of those early accounts of what happened to people when they took Kaleidico was just kind of magical. Um, because here you have this little drug and I followed the history of this drug. I, you know, how it was made, you know, how people change the shape of the molecules to do this or that and, you know, or add this part onto the molecule and the drug would work better. And to hear about people's experiences when they took the drug and how quickly this thing started to work. Um, working within hours, you know, you know, they were struck with disbelief at, at things happening in their body, you know, people being able to taste things for the first time, smell things for the first time, you know, um, breathe and, and laugh and inhale. I mean, hearing that was, was truly magical. Um, you know, it was, and hearing the, the family's response and just the fact that you know, this coughing that had been incessant in so many different households, you know, nights and nights and nights of coughing, um, everything was quiet. And that that transformation and the, the clearing out of the lungs, it was like purging all this stuff and and freeing the lungs and freeing the person and and hearing about the lifestyle changes that then ensued, you know, all the time that not only the the children had and the young adults had but the families got you know this gift of all this time that they would spend doing therapy and now they didn't need it or they didn't need clean outs or the clean outs were now very rare and just hearing about you know it didn't just affect that one patient it affected their whole family it affected their future and and having people tell me that, you know, they hadn't planned on families or finishing grad school or any of that. And, and hearing them, you know, suddenly have this realization that they could have it. They could have more, they could have a full life. I mean, it was, it was very emotional <laughs> to hear that from people. And yeah, I mean, I'm still in touch with a bunch of people and hearing about, you know, they've been, they've gotten married, they're living in other countries, they can now travel um, as they would like to because they have this life-saving medication. Um, that is just, I mean, when are you going to hear all of that and, and, you know, see that most of that history and story took place in my lifetime and I can still meet everybody and mm -hmm. that's, that's a gift. That's a gift. And that is a wonderful gift. Yeah. And and what has the response been from people to your book? Um, have you gotten any feedback or how is the response? Um, the response is solid. Um, <laughs> the book came out in a pandemic, which is my agent said, this has got to be the worst time in the last 50 years to publish a book. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it came out, it actually, the date it was published is very special. It's September 7th, um, 2020. And September 7th is the day that the the gene that was published in the journal Science. So I thought that was pretty auspicious um, and a that wonderful is. coincidence. But I've had amazing um, letters from people um, around the world about you know, the book and, and their family's story and, and how, how much they appreciated the book. So that, that has been wonderful. Um, you know, I had very much hoped to go out and, you know, the, the gift of this process was supposed to be, you know, meeting families and talking to families and, and, you know, doing some readings and, and really, you know, getting back out there. But, you know, it's, uh, two years of a pandemic. So, I mean, I still, you know, fingers crossed, I still want to do that. And, and it's because it's been weird. The pandemic's been weird. I had all this contact with the CF community, the book comes out and then, then I don't get to see anyone. Um, so oh, you definitely have to do a tour around <laughs> and we'll cheer you on from Canada and Absolutely. Detroit. Well, I want to go yeah. and talk to everybody that I talked to before. And, and, you know, um, yes, we're going to have a party when you, 
when you can start your book tours again, Beth and I, we got you. We got absolutely. <laughs> yes. The North American Cystic Fibrosis Conference. I mean, that had become part of my life. I was really actually very used to going to that. And it's on my calendar every year. And to not go to it or when it turned virtual, I was like, oh, my God. You know, I won't get to see anybody. I won't get to talk to anybody. And um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to resuming human contact and and uh, as soon as it's safe. So we're, are we. We're getting there. Yeah, this this in itself, like bringing your, your book to more people. And like you said, it was such a tough time to, for the release. But, you know, we were on it and um, loving it. And this is such a great opportunity to get it out to more people. And then we're talking about maybe another chat too, right, Laura? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, we have our webinar coming up. Right. We're going to do our webinar in May, May 4th. And people can look for all the details in the show notes. But absolutely, um, we're going to give away two of your books um, to two people who participate in the webinar. So we have that to look forward to. Uh, but yeah, we're just delighted, delighted to talk to you. Uh, so thrilled to read your book and get to know you a little bit. Um, really glad you're part of the CF community. Thank you. Um, we welcome you. You're stuck with us forever. Yeah. So <laughs> Yay. You're not getting yeah, you rid see, of us. <laughs> that is the biggest gift of all is having so many friends and you know i talk to joe all the time and and i mean really that's that's one of the greatest gifts we'll be friends forever and i think you know having those forever friends i'm so lucky i'm so lucky that everyone said yes to me so and i just wanted to point out i don't think this story could have been told by anybody as well as it was from you Aww. vigil because truly because you're connected, you care. And like every person in that journey, in that book that cared and poured their heart and soul into it, you poured your heart and soul into telling that story. So what a beautiful collaboration, because we feel that too. And I think that's what makes it even more special. It wasn't some outside person coldly looking at what happened and documenting. You you created a life in that book of our journeys. And um, I think it was a a beautiful story and, and I appreciate it because I think um, you really put a caring spin on the whole story and we feel that throughout the entire book. Oh, thank you. And I, I, I agree. I think that's a great way to end this podcast, but it was like almost 3D, right, mm -hmm. Beth? It was so big reading your yeah. book. It was so like almost like a movie yeah. because we were so engaged in it. It was so and the layers just constantly and layers, moving. Layers, yes. right? Like, yeah. It was so well written. Yeah. Just Thanks. magical, really. Thank you. Just life. It was just fantastic. So thank you for joining us in this podcast, for Beth having Van Stone me. and I, and Visual Trevetti. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I, I look forward to the webinar and, and seeing you again soon. It's been thank so you. great chatting with you. And thank you. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin Allen. It's not complicated. Who happens to have cystic fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know what's got you frustrated. But loving you is so all right. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, check them out online at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical, the science of possibility, and produced by Jagged Detroit Podcasts, 